On April 12, 1981, the isolated town of Keddy, California, was shattered by a gruesome discovery. In the early hours of that morning, 14-year-old Sheila Sharp returned home from a sleepover to her home in Cabin 28 at the Keddy Resort, only to find her mother, brother, and his friend brutally murdered. The victims were 36-year-old Sue Sharp, her son John, and his friend Dana Wingate. Sue's daughter Tina was mysteriously missing from the crime scene. The Sharp family had moved to the Keddy Resort cabins just five months prior, seeking a fresh start after Sue left her troubled marriage. When Sheila made the horrific discovery, a nightmare was unleashed upon the close-knit community of around 100 people at the time, one that would haunt it for decades to come. The case has never been resolved, but new evidence did emerge in recent years which raised many new questions about how the police and higher authorities handled it. I invite you to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the stories of the grim and macabre. Now, let's lift the thin veil. Glenna Sharp was a dark-haired, attractive single mother with five children, and everyone called her Sue. In 1979, she left her abusive husband and her brother, who would help her and the children start a new life. He lived in Quincy, California, about 150 miles north of Sacramento. Sue packed her life up and, with her children, moved across the country from North Carolina to a trailer home owned by her brother. Described as a loner, Sue didn't socialize much and didn't have very many friends. However, she did manage to make one close friend, Glenna Meeks, and was also seeing a man named Daryl, but they'd only been on a few dates. She was enrolled in business classes at Feather River Community College and was known to be a diligent student who put in a lot of effort to maintain excellent grades. Sue's ex-husband served in the military when they got divorced, so the Navy provided her with $250 every month as a stipend. In addition to that, Sue took up a part-time job at the Quincy Elks Lodge as a dishwasher. The family ended up sharing a single room in her brother's trailer, and after living there for a little while, they felt it was simply too small for the family of six. Among her kids, John, at 15 years old, was the oldest boy, while Sheila, aged 14, was the oldest girl. Tina was 12 years old, and the two younger boys were Rick, aged 10, and Greg, who was just 5 years old. It was clear that the Sharp family needed a larger home, and that's when they looked just 5 miles away in the former resort town of Keddy, California, where rent was low. Keddy is a small community in Plumas County, near the Nevada border and the Sierra Nevada mountains. It was once a busy railroad terminal, but once the railroad closed down, it put many people out of work and had lost much of its population. The town tried to reinvent itself by becoming a recreational camping and hiking resort area. However, when this failed, the Keddy resort owner, Gary Moloth, turned a series of cabins into low-income rental housing. Sue saw the space the cabin had to offer, and although it was in a poor condition, it seemed perfect for her, especially because she preferred being surrounded by a more rural, forested area. With the limited income she earned, Sue managed to rent cabin 28 in Keddy in late 1980. Throughout the following months, Sue put in a lot of effort to transform their new mountain community into a permanent home for their children. It was originally a one-room hut for railroad workers, but had been enlarged three times by 1980. There were two bedrooms on the ground floor, along with an unfinished basement. Sue and the girls chose the back bedroom, while the two youngest brothers occupied the front bedroom. John occupied a room in the unfinished basement. Sue and the children were in and out of cabin 28 all day on April 11th, 1981. Rick and Greg would be spending the night with a boy from the neighborhood named Justin Eason that evening. Since the afternoon, the three boys had been spending time at Cabin 28. John and his friend Dana, who was 17 and known to be a bit of a troublemaker, had gone to hang out in nearby Quincy for the day. Sue went to Quincy around 1.30pm with her oldest daughter Sheila to pick up John and Dana, who left the house again around 3.30pm for a party in Quincy. Before they left, Sue would warn them to not hitchhike home. 
Sue spent the rest of the afternoon with Sheila and Tina, but both girls had plans to spend the night with their friends next door in cabin 27 at the Seabolt family home. The Sharps and Seabolts had become incredibly close over the past few months and the Seabolts' two daughters had become fast friends with both Sheila and Tina. They spent the night watching television there. At around 9.30pm, Tina returned home to cabin 28 but Sheila decided to spend the night at the Seabolts with her friend Alyssa, a decision that probably saved her life. At around 7.45 the next morning, which was a Sunday, Sheila went back to her family's cabin, quite literally a few feet away, to pick up the clothes she was going to wear to church. When Sheila opened the front door, she was shocked to discover, on the front room floor, the blood-covered bodies of Sue, John, and his friend, Dana Wingate. Sheila wasted no time and swiftly exited the cabin, screaming and rushing back to the neighboring Seabolt house to seek help. The authorities were notified promptly, but Jamie Seabolt took it upon himself to check the state of the occupants in cabin 28. With a sense of urgency, Jamie made his way to the cabin to check if anyone had survived. Inside the house, Rick, Greg, and their friend Justin were peacefully sleeping in the bedroom, seemingly oblivious to the events that had unfolded. Jamie guided the three boys out of the house, leading them through the bedroom window to shield them from the traumatic crime scene. The Siebold family, who lacked a phone of their own, raced to the next lodge to make the call. They contacted the police, who arrived on the scene at approximately 8.05 a.m. Officers from the Plumas County Sheriff's Office were dispatched from their local office in Quincy and they began responding within minutes. The murders were extremely brutal. Deputy Hank Clement was a first responder and he described a scene covered in blood. It was on the walls, the victim's shoes, Sue's bare feet, the bedding in Tina's room, the furniture, the ceiling, the doors, and even on the back steps. The amount of blood indicated to the investigators that the victims had been moved and rearranged after being killed. John was found closest to the front door, lying face up with blood-covered hands that were bound with medical tape. His throat had been slit and his head was smashed in with a hammer. His friend Dana was on the floor beside him, lying face down on a blood-soaked couch pillow. Like John, he had been beaten in the head with a hammer, but his body also showed signs that someone had attempted to strangle Dana by hand. Their ankles were tied together with electrical wire and medical tape connecting the two. Sue had been partially covered with a blanket, although it did little to conceal her horrifying injuries. She was lying on her side, naked from the waist down, gagged tightly with her own underwear and hogtied with medical tape. She had injuries consistent with the struggle and there was an imprint of a pellet gun on the side of her head. Her hands had signs of defensive wounds. Although there was no indication that sexual assault took place, like her son, her throat had been slit. Every victim sustained multiple stab wounds. It was thought that the murderers had utilized two or more different rolls of medical tape, which could have been discovered within the Sharp residence. Sue's kitchen was missing a steak knife, which was probably used as a weapon. Also, there was a tiny wooden table close to the kitchen entrance that had a bloodied butcher's knife and a claw hammer side by side. Sue's head injury was consistent with a shattered plastic component from a BB pistol that was lying on the floor. They also spotted a bloody fingerprint on the handrail that leads down from the back door pointing to the direction that the killers had fled. The criminals did not spill any of their own blood. If they were hurt during the event, it wasn't serious. But they did leave some DNA on a strip of tape, but this was a time before DNA testing. The cops found no evidence of forced entry, but a toolbox had been removed from the house. A second hammer, thought to be a murder weapon, was also missing from the scene along with a knife taken from the Sharp Holmes kitchen. It would take the police several hours to realize that a fourth victim, Tina, was missing, which means the FBI would have to be involved. The police decided then to see if there were any witnesses. Several neighbors near cabin 28 reported hearing muffled shouts or groans between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. Unfortunately, they were unable to pinpoint where the sounds were coming from and returned to sleep. Some neighbors reported seeing a green van parked outside cabin 28 at about 9pm that evening, while others subsequently saw a brown Datsun 
with a flat tire. Unfortunately, these leads did not aid with the investigation. An initial prominent theory centered on the teenage victims John Sharp and Dana Wingate, who had made a repeat visit to the cabin on the night of the killings. They appeared to be trying to hitchhike home when they were last spotted in the town of Quincy at around 10 p.m. Police speculated that their driver might have been the murderer, perhaps someone who had followed them home or harbored resentment towards them both. It was thought that the party goers John and Dana had met at the party the night of the murders might have information regarding the killings, but because of the potential use of drugs and alcohol, potential witnesses refrained from coming forward. In the months following the murders, there were persistent suspicions in the community that the killings had something to do with this party or drug sales in general, even though there was no proof for these claims. Local resident Carla McMillan informed police that Dana Wingate had recently stolen some LSD from neighborhood drug traffickers, but she had no evidence to support this allegation. All of it was based on rumors. Within the Sharp family's cabin, police discovered no trace of drugs or drug paraphernalia, nor any indication that any of the victims had any connection to the drug trade. Likewise, tales of a possible satanic sacrifice also spread over time. Police stated early on that there was no indication that this was a crime motivated by a cult or beliefs. Rather, they believed it was personal in nature, which was reflected in the extreme violence that had occurred that evening. Rick, Greg and Justin, the boys who survived the incident, claimed they slept through the entire thing. Given the level of violence that occurred and the noise it would have caused, this seemed unlikely. Furthermore, the murderers must have been aware that the boys were in the cabin. They were only a few feet away from each other in another room separated by a thin wall. It begs the question, why did the killers not harm the three children? Investigators speculated that someone may have interrupted the murderers before the perpetrators could kill the boys in their bedrooms. Later, authorities discovered that not all of the boys were truly asleep and there was more to the story. In a psychologist's interview, Justin, who was staying over in cabin 28 that night with Rick and Greg, disclosed for the first time that he was beginning to dream about seeing the two perpetrators in the house. Over time, this evolved into him confessing that he actually saw the two perpetrators. Under hypnosis, he described hearing what he thought was two muffled noises coming from males and the voice of Sue. They were initially having a quiet conversation which started to get angry and loud. Justin then said he heard John and Dana enter the home and argue with the men, eventually resulting in a violent brawl. Tina was then allegedly led out the cabin's rear door by one of the males. The issue with this hypnosis session was that the adults in the room, the presiding psychologist, Dr. Dash, and Sheriff Doug Thomas, were leading Justin to a lot of the answers. Justin was a suggestible 12-year-old child, and this session took place one whole month after the murders, so you can probably see the problem here. Regardless, this hypnosis session with Justin would provide the authorities with descriptions of the two men that might have been potentially involved in this crime. One of the males was clean-shaven and had long hair. The other one had a mustache and short hair. They both wore glasses. This description was used to create the infamous composite sketches by Harlan Embry, a man with no artistic ability and no training in forensic sketching. It was never explained why, with access to the Justice Department's and the FBI's top forensic artists, law enforcement chose to use an amateur who sometimes volunteered to help the local police. The police started to search for suspects based on Justin's description, and one of the people turned out to be Justin's stepfather, Martin Smith, who was known to everyone as Marty. Marty was a Vietnam War veteran with PTSD. He lived close in cabin 26 with his wife Marilyn and her two sons, Justin and Casey. He had recently lost his job as a cook at Keddy Restaurant. Him and his wife Marilyn were friends with Sue Sharp and took typing classes at the community college with her. Most accounts of Martin depict him as a shady character with a criminal past and a harsh attitude. He confessed to having anger issues and Marilyn even alleged that he attempted to run her and her son over and was abusive towards her and her children. This caused Justin to have resentment towards Marty. Marilyn confided in Sue about Marty's abusive behavior. Sue, herself a victim of domestic violence, persuaded Marilyn to leave her husband, which she did on the day of the murders. Some believe that Sue and Marty were having a secret affair while Sue was advising Marilyn to leave Marty. 
During questioning, Marty revealed that a claw hammer with a blue handle had been stolen from his garage. What's strange is that this revelation came before the public learned that two of the murder weapons were hammers. After passing a polygraph test and hearing his alibi that he was at the Keddie's backdoor bar with his friend John Boobaday, Martin was not pursued by investigators any further and was not arrested or questioned again. Marty relocated to Reno, Nevada after his marriage failed and he started visiting a counselor at the Veterans Administration there. In 1981, this counselor came out with the claim that Marty had admitted to killing Tina as well as Sue. He said that his motivation was retaliation for Sue trying to persuade his wife to leave him. Tina, on the other hand, had seen everything, which was why he had killed her, but he declined to take accountability for the deaths of John and Dana. In a letter Marty addressed to Marilyn, one particular passage also caught attention. I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? Some claimed that Marty was talking about how much he regretted spending so much time with Marilyn and her family instead of his own four children from a previous marriage. Some perceive it as a confession about the four individuals who were killed in Cabin 28. The police did not acknowledge this information as evidence and did not find a reason to look into it any further. Later, a witness said he observed Marty burn garments on the morning of the murders. There was no bloody clothing retrieved from the offenders at the scene, indicating that they either took the clothes with them or disposed of them. Burning the clothing might have done the trick. It was also revealed that Marty had a friendly relationship with a local county sheriff, Doug Thomas, at the time of the crime. Being interviewed next to Marty at the same time in the same room was his friend, John Boobaday, who had been residing with him at the time of the murders. He was also a lead suspect. Interviewing two suspects at the same time in the same room is generally uncommon. John Boobaday was a convicted felon that had been in and out of prison for multiple burglary and drug-related crimes. Only a few weeks prior to the murders, the two had crossed paths at the local Veterans Administration Hospital where Boobaday was undergoing treatment for PTSD. John Boobaday was known as Bo to everyone around him. According to Bo's story, Marilyn, him, and Marty had gone out together at the neighborhood pub the night of the Keddie Cabin killings. Afterwards, all three went back home, but Marty and Bo went out to the pub once more to continue drinking. This part might have been true as the stories were corroborated by witnesses at the pub. However, there is one piece missing from the story. Marty and Bo would be missing for a few hours before they returned to the pub, and when they did return, they were dressed in flashy suits and sunglasses. Some say their choice of outfits was intentional to draw attention to themselves in order to set up an alibi. Bo revealed to investigators during his questioning that he had served as a Chicago police officer for 18 years. This was false information. He also gave a false impression of how long he had resided in Keddy. He also made the untrue claim that Marilyn was his niece. According to some accounts, Bo harbored feelings for Sue, who allegedly turned him down twice. Police cleared him as a suspect despite his lies and inconsistent claims. Some believed that Bo was employed by the Chicago Mafia as an enforcer and had a criminal history. Investigators think he was acting as an informant for the Department of Justice. On the other hand, Bo had a reputation of being a con man and a scam artist to some. It's unclear as there is not much information available about him. What did strike as odd to many is that the Sacramento Department of Justice dispatched organized crime investigators to the Sharp family murder investigation rather than homicide detectives. The initial request for assistance to the California Department of Justice was completely ignored. What specific proof connects Bo to the Mafia is unknown. Still, it begs a lot of questions. Was this the reason Bo was never thoroughly investigated by detectives? Is this the reason investigators appeared to ignore several hints and pieces of evidence? Were they trying to protect an informant? Another thing that does not add up to me is that if Bo was part of a mafia outfit, why was he sleeping on a friend's couch in a small community in the middle of nowhere? It's been suggested he was under witness protection, but doesn't that warrant at least an alias separate from his legal name? Marilyn had later stated that she woke up at 2am and noticed the two men burning something on the wood stove. She would also tell investigators that she thought her estranged husband had something to do with the murders in the days following the discovery of the victims in Cabin 28. 
This was due to his violent and aggressive temperament, which became especially evident when he started drinking. It is strongly believed that Tina was there at the site of the murders in cabin 28. The evidence pointed to a kidnapping by the criminals, so a missing persons bulletin was sent out. The FBI was initially involved in her search since she was a minor, but after about a month, for reasons that are unclear, they decided to end their investigation. On April 11th, 1984, exactly three years after the murders, Ronald Pedrini reported a strange discovery in the woods some 90 miles southwest of Keddy. He was gathering bottles when he stumbled upon a human skull and mandible. At first, investigators believed it might be a Native American person's, but according to a mysterious call to the sheriff's office, the caller implied that it was in fact Tina Sharp. A forensic examination of the teeth two months later verified the mysterious caller's claims. Detectives also found an empty surgical tape dispenser, a blue jacket, a blanket, and a pair of jeans, with a missing back pocket near her bones in the woods, but none of the evidence pointed to the killers or explained how she passed away. If we take Marty's counselor's word for it, then Tina was killed because she was a witness. But why was she taken elsewhere rather than being killed at the spot like the rest of her family? Remarkably, nobody attempted to follow up with the caller, and the tape of the anonymous tip regarding Tina was found sealed in case files, untouched by the Plumas County Sheriff's Department. It would be reopened in 2013 with new investigators Sheriff Greg Hagwood and Special Investigator Mike Gamberg. At the time of the Keddie Cabin killings, Gamberg was a rookie deputy with the Plumas County Sheriff's Office, but he was not involved in the case in any way because the sheriff at the time, Doc Thomas, kept him out of it. Even his leads in the case were ignored. As a Quincy deputy who knew many of the area residents and had experience in homicide investigations, and as someone who knew at least two of the victims, he believes his input should have been taken seriously. Gamberg and Hagwood both later stated that the Keddie case was solvable and that during the initial investigation, both the Department of Justice and local deputies made crucial mistakes. Gamberg also criticized the authorities with the lack of care shown at logging and managing the evidence collected at the scene. He added that carelessness with freezer maintenance and a power outage ruined a large amount of potential DNA evidence that was kept there. It is unclear why Marty was cleared so quickly despite the circumstantial evidence linking him to the crime. Why was it not looked into further? I'm going to look at both sides, so bear with me here. Sue's meddling in his marriage his alleged confessions to his counselor and in the letter to his wife, the burning of the clothes the morning after the murders, the possibility that he was connected to one of the murder weapons, and his sudden departure from Keddie soon after the killings, all provided him with a motive. With Bo being part of organized crime in a role that is likely violent, he might have not needed much convincing to partake as well. On the other hand, as was already mentioned, the purported confession in the letter to his wife might be alluding to something else entirely. The counselor's claim might just be a fabrication. There is no way to corroborate what Marty said to him, and the mention of the lost hammer might just be Marty's fear-mongering that it had something to do with the murder at Cabin 28. Keddy was a small community, and details of the murder could have easily been leaked. Lastly, if Bo was part of a large mafia outfit in Chicago, what was he doing in a small town of less than 100 people at the time, sleeping on a friend's sofa, there are web sleuths that still claim that he was nothing more than a con artist. Being a con artist is one thing, but being responsible for the brutal execution of four people is another. Whether the close relationship between Marty and Sheriff Thomas played any part in the decision not to conduct a more complete investigation is up for debate. Given the nature of smaller communities, it is likely that members of the community know one another well, so it's not strange that they were close. Whatever your thoughts are here about whether or not they were the murderers, you should leave them below. But there is a lot of evidence that links Marty and Bo to the crimes in Cabin 28, which should have been looked into further. There are some who argue that the killings were not planned and instead happened as a result of a failed robbery. The only thing is that the Sharps were not a well-off family, so why would robbers choose to target their house? There is also no evidence that anything of value was stolen from the house other than a kitchen knife and a toolbox. If the robbers' only goal was to steal, then why would they carry out such brutal killings? Holding victims hostage for an extended period of time while remaining on the scene is a matter totally different 
from the brutal way the four victims were executed. Anger and rage seem to have played a role in this murder, feelings that a regular thief would usually not harbor. But like with any other scenario, it's possible that before taking Tina hostage, a robber or robbers entered, became enraged because there was nothing to steal, and then tortured and killed the victims. Following the killings, Bo left Keddie and went back to Chicago where he passed away in 1988, and Marty died in the year 2000. The Ketty Resort deteriorated over time, and Cabin 28 was destroyed in 2004. Since then, the entire location has been deserted, and the community of Ketty had less than 60 inhabitants in 2013. After discovering the call during his recruitment in 2013, Gambrick forwarded the audio to other law enforcement organizations for review and potential leads. In 2016, a man using a metal detector to search the area around Keddie's entrance discovered a hammer in a dried up pond. It fit the description Martin provided during his interrogation. Sheriff Hagwood thinks that someone purposefully threw it into the water as the location couldn't have happened by chance. Gamberg also found a hunting knife in Keddy hidden behind some clutter, which he sent in for additional examination. Then, in April 2018, Gamberg was able to match a known living suspect's DNA with that of the murder site. The names have never been made public, and no arrests have been made since. According to Gamberg, there might have been six persons involved. There has been no update provided on their identities since. The surviving Sharp children were sent off into the foster care system. The Sharp family case is currently not being investigated due to lack of funding. Thanks for listening to this case, which is sad, messy, and frankly speaking, quite frustrating. It's hard to analyze and speculate on unresolved cases with confidence, especially when a lot of evidence has not been made available to the public. It is likely that Marty and Bo were involved with this murder, but because of a lackluster investigation and smoke and mirrors around the evidence, it's not something we can be sure of till the case is solved.